My name is Jan Berner. I'm going to introduce you to our workshop today. So welcome to all of you. We have a full program and we want to start right away. And I'd like to right now jump into our agenda and uh, in order for everyone to be on the same page in terms of what we mean by governance, uh, I'll now give the word to Janos who will share his screen and uh, give you a three to four minute introduction to what we mean by governance before we jump into our panel debate with our five, six or five panelists. This is Dr. Janos Förster from the Center of Development Research, the University of Bonn. I have the pleasure of briefly introducing uh, what governance is and how that relates to the bioeconomy. And without uh, further ado, government is what governments do and what governmental actors do. This is a more top-down perspective of governing by public uh, governmental bodies, authorities, uh, but surely also policies and legislation which are complied to or not by societal actors. More of a structural view, a linear view, and linked to what we know as top-down policy making and implementation. For others, governments, governance is what governments do, but also much more, while the real policy implementers are located on ground level. This is where societal actors pool their interests, articulate them, and thus influence governmental actions, policy, or the like. A more agential view on informal rules and institutions, social learning process in a more participatory or collaborative and bottom-up perspective on governance. For again others, governance is the totality of public and private actors and institutions, mechanisms and processes, all of them interacting and influencing each other mutually while also interacting with the dimensions of the bioeconomy. Such the bioeconomy is across cutter, across sectors and across policy fields, levels of society and within different but mostly interrelated fields of policy. So this is a more integrated perspective on bioeconomy governance as collaborative governance for the green heart of a circular economy to keep developments within planetary boundaries. And the green heart of circular economy is the bioeconomy. But what for this session might fit is a working definition of governance as the attempt to coordinate social, social political, socio-economic action, uh, to coordinate collective behavioral patterns, to make people work together, to initiate, to adapt, to navigate bioeconomic trends and dynamics while trying to avoid negative feedback loops on ourselves and this giant ecosystem called Earth. So this steering attempt often comes in a more concrete form of packages of policies, legislation, regulation, etc., in order to enable and constrain a certain bioeconomic development or innovation or others. Enabling governance, we can think of maybe incentives, subsidies, administrative support, but also public and private research funding. So the development where the government says, yes, I really want you to do this or even more of it. And the constraining character of policy comes into play when the governments want to prevent or inhibit a certain dynamic. For example, when a development negatively impacts the achievement of global SDG targets and to keep bioeconomy in certain sustainability performances. So through steering impulses from enabling and constraining governance, it is attempted to coordinate socioeconomic and socioecological impacts to stay within a certain sustainability threshold or boundaries. So this admittedly is rather an ideal type situation for governance. However, for evidence-based policy and governance, which is more needed than ever these days, information and thus empirical data is also needed in order to enable governmental actors to determine when to act, how to do so, and for which purpose and in which time frame. And with this, I've also created an ice bridge to the scientific tools used to measure sustainability performance in the bioeconomy, which was subject of some of the pre-conference videos and are also part of these following sessions with all of you. Welcome to it. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Janosch. Uh, life is always better than video, I think. Uh, so that worked nicely. Um, I'd like to give over, um, pass over to uh, my colleague Christian Lutz now to moderate the Impulse Talks. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we have now a really dedicated high-level panel of six speakers. They have only five minutes. 
uh, all six of them, uh, but you'll all have uh, some uh, possibility afterwards to, to ask some questions, uh, at least in the chat, so they will, will be there for discussion afterwards. Um, I will only say a very few words for everyone. Um, in, the first speaker is Diane uh, De Iulis. I hope I missed, didn't mispronounce anything, from the U.S. National Defense University. Um, she's once been working on on, uh, on, on bioeconomy for the, for the White House, really interesting in these times, but please go ahead, Diane, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, um, and thank you for your inviting me to the panel. Um, I'm going to just make some comments today in a st about a study that I was involved with called uh, Safeguarding the Bioeconomy, and this was a study that the government funded um, for uh, at the National Academy of Sciences. And the goal, if you go to the first slide, the next slide, um, actually I can do it I think here. Oh great, I can do it myself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here is the this uh, study, safeguarding the bioeconomy, and the study itself was very broad. This is a very long study. I encourage people to read it because I think it's very good. One half of the whole study was just to define the bioeconomy and to uh, explore ways that we could measure it economically. The other half of the study and the study part that I was most involved with was try to identify risks related to the U.S. bioeconomy. In other words, what would prevent us from having a robust and healthy bioeconomy? And what kind of governance and policy approaches could we take to um, fix those vulnerabilities? So we found that those fell into really two broad categories. One, which we describe as a failure to promote the bioeconomy. And a second one, which would be a failure to protect the bioeconomy. Those were the two large areas of risks that we identified. So I won't read all these to you um, because we ha don't have very much time. But under the failure to promote the U.S. bioeconomy, this may seem very uh, obvious and fundamental, but we didn't want to leave it out. We didn't want uh, to gloss over it because we think it's important to make the statements. So one is that we worried about that there could be an insufficient U.S. government investment in the basic R&D, the fundamental research that drives the bioeconomy. And in this in particular, we uh, what comes with this R&D investment is not just helping to drive the bioeconomy, but it helps to build scientific leadership roles that can then go into international forums and represent the United States as leaders in the bioeconomy discussion, in the bioeconomy environment, and, and have a role, a participatory role at the table, if you will, um, for broader governance discussions. And this is also tied to having a workforce that could work in the bioeconomy. We need people who are going to uh, do the biological work that's needed, whether it's a startup company or academia or a large company. Also important in this category, and this is related to the second category, which I will explain, um, is that if we have a situation where the intellectual property environment or the government regulatory environment is confusing, or is, is not clear to those who want to help build the bioeconomy, they may shy away from taking innovation or more risky innovations. So for example, if companies are unclear of a regulatory pathway of how they might get a new bioeconomy product approved, they may not take that path. Path. They may stay with a more fundamental uh, approach that is something that they have done in the past that they know the regulatory and the intellectual property landscape. And they may not take a, a bigger risk in um, pursuing innovation. And finally, and I think uh, the intro speaker talked about this public trust, um, we want to make sure that there's a good communication strategy that promotes the bioeconomy so that we have public trust and we don't conflict with public values. On the other side of this would be then the failure to protect the bioeconomy. 
And again, there's many things listed here. This was a long report and I won't go through all of them. But I will state that one of the biggest areas that we spent a lot of time talking about was data, data security, and how data will be managed and shared. So data is really, biological data is really a driver of the bioeconomy. And so many of the recommendations that we came up with were to look at data. Um, and I will just show you uh, three here. Again, having three whole recommendations in the study just devoted to this data issue, best practices, um, investing in the modernization and curation and integrity of databases, and also groups for information sharing and protection of uh, cyber risks. Finally, and this is not something that was covered specifically in the study, but I wanted to take the opportunity to mention it here, which is, again, tying to this biological data, I think we have the responsibility to think about how this data can be shared very broadly. There's many discussions within the Convention on Biological Diversity. The Nagoya Protocol, for example, um, looks at benefit sharing. And um, there are many global efforts like the Earth Biogenome Project, the Global Viral Genome, there's many like these whose goal is to broadly share genomic data. And I think that's going to be extremely important moving forward. So finally, um, this is my last uh, slide. In terms of overarching broad governance, our, our recommendation to the U.S. government and to the White House um, was to say that we need a national strategy and a coordinating mechanism to promote and protect the U.S. bioeconomy. And we also strongly recommend international engagement and particip the participation of the United States in forums for international cooperation on bioeconomies. Um, so thank you very much. I know that, that was very short and I did not do justice to the whole report, uh, but I, if you have questions, I'll be happy to um, answer them afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Then we move to, to the next speaker, which is uh, Pablo uh, Pacheco from WWF. Uh, he's the, the global forest lead scientist um, and uh, worked before as principal scientist at the Center for International Forestry Research in, in Indonesia. So he's a uh, real an expert in, in the forest question. Pablo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christian. Uh, I'm going to give you some of my thinking about the uh, bioeconomy and implications and mechanisms that could be used to enhance the governance of uh, products associated with the bioeconomy. I didn't prepare a presentation, but uh, I will just share some, some of, of, my, of my thinking. Uh, and we know that the bioeconomy comprises a whole range of activities along different value chains. So we are talking about biofuels, biomass, biomaterials, food, and these involve many stakeholders in this value chain, which adopt different practices. And these practices can be uh, different in terms of how sustainable they are. And also there are multiple sectoral policies and policy domains that are going to regulate and govern the production and trade of feedstocks or end products or materials associated with the bioeconomy. And at the same time, new markets, new investment flows, shifts in consumer preferences, so may create opportunities for expanding the positive social and econ economic impacts of these activities, but also may create uh, negative or may have negative implications related to land use, social inclusion and equity. Well, I think there's a good knowledge about what are the positive implications of bioeconomy development on land, on improving efficiencies, uh, and increasing income streams for producers, jobs, income, etc. But also there may be negative implications. And this is when we talk about uh, expansion of materials that may supply the bioeconomy that also can produce pressures on land and displace people from these lands, concentrate benefits on more capitalized farmers, but also can have a negative uh, biodiversity implications and biodiversity loss. So we, uh, uh, what I'm trying to argue is that these impacts, either positive or negative, or the trade-offs that can arise, depend on a specific governance conditions. Uh, and these governance conditions are associated with specific governance deficits, what I'm calling 
or failures in key sectors on geography. So, and we need to take a closer look at what are these different uh, governance deficits and how to deal with those. And these deficits may be linked to a lack of transparency, for example, perverse incentives or market failures. So the challenge in my view is how to uh, overcome these deficits while at the same time mitigating the negative social and environmental impacts of material supply and creating opportunities linked to the bioeconomy development, mainly for uh, smallholders and communities, which tend to be excluded and marginalized. So what I want to argue is that there are like four different mechanisms or instruments that also could be part of our discussions about how to improve the governance of the bioeconomy. And these should be seen in complementarity with public regulations that already exist and also they have to be improved. So there's need of complementarities, but also there's a need for uh, improving the convergence in a scope, principles and criteria among these different private initiatives that I'm going to talk about. The first that I want, I would like to refer is the social and environmental safeguards. I think safeguards have become a quite important tool and instrument that have been adopted by investors and the corporate sector. For example, the World Bank in 2016 adopted a new set of environmental and social policies called the environmental and social framework to deal with environmental and social risk of projects. And these include uh, uh, conducting assessments, planning, monitoring, and reporting. Another important development of safeguards also was related to RED, you know, the, the programs for reduction of emissions of deforestation and, and forest degradation. And these uh, have been slowly being negotiated, developed, and embraced by some countries that are moving towards adopting RED uh, frameworks in their policies. And somehow the adoption of these safeguards is going to make countries eligible for result-based payments in their efforts to hold deforestation. So that, I think that's an important mechanism to, to include. The second is related to environmental standards. As, and as we know, there have been a multiple um, standards that have been develop, developed related to specific commodities, you know, timber, soy, oil palm, uh, biofuels, etc., and carbon. And now there's even much more effort to try to uh, promote some convergence of the criteria that is underpinning the sustainability standards. For example, all the work that ICL Alliance is doing uh, in, in that direction. And I think that um, it's important, uh, these efforts, to have some common frameworks for assessing and verifying sustainability across different uh, uh, commodities. But still we know that these environmental standards may have limitations uh, because of the limited uptake, but also there are efforts for these standards to be targeted specifically and create uh, mechanisms for smallholders, for example, to adopt more widely this type of standard. So I think that's an important governance mechanism adopted by private sector that we have to take into account. The third one is voluntary commitments. And we have seen that it has been a prolifer proliferation of uh, corporate commitments to uh, improve their policies and measures to uh, mainstream uh, social and environmental uh, sustainability and minimize risks associated to their supply chains. And complementary effort has been uh, the development of the accountability framework initiative, which is to provide guidance for companies to become more reliable in the processes of mainstreaming uh, sustainability practices and reporting as well. Uh, so I think that's an important development that can be extended to this discussion of, uh, of the bioeconomy, how to have more robust accountability frameworks. And the fourth one is related to partnerships. And also we have seen in the last time uh, lots of developments of partnerships and partnerships that they have multiple objectives like the risk in finance, mobilizing finance for smallholders, uh, improving the uptake of sustainability practices, developing alternative livelihoods for smallholders in, in, in risky places. So, uh, and this is becoming a more important governance instrument for um, mobilizing efforts and support uh, collaborations. So I think uh, I, I just wanted to offer this uh, possibility of looking more uh, and tapping more into this type of instruments if we want to improve the, the governance and uh, govern the likelihood of uh, impact or the potential and negative impacts of bioeconomy 
on social and environment, but also creating opportunities. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Pablo. Um, our next speaker is Maria uh, Eugenia Silva Carasone. Um, she's from Uruguay. She's currently working for the FAO in Rome. Um, and she's talking about national bioeconomy strategies. Uh, actually, that's what she's also working for the FAO. Great to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you very much to the organizers for the invite. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And good evening, good afternoon to, to all the, the participants. So yes, I'm going to, to share with you a little bit of the work that we're doing at FAO, working in circular and sustainable bioeconomy from the perspective of governance, national governance, and international governance. So FAO is implementing the BIMEL funded project towards sustainable bioeconomy guidelines to support countries in the development of sustainable and circular bioeconomy. And there we have a South South Triangular Cooperation Platform, which is called the International Sustainable Bioeconomy Working Group, ISBWG, that has more than 35 uh, members from all the continents. And the purpose of this platform is to foster knowledge exchange on lessons learned, good practices, monitoring and policy tools related to the bioeconomy. And also this, this group was settled to advise the FAO and the project, uh, which is currently rolled out in Uruguay, in Namibia, and soon it will be implemented in, in Asia. So this working group agreed on a set of principles and criteria that work as a guideline to mainstream sustainability in the bioeconomy strategies. And these principles cover the economic, the environmental, and the social dimension of sustainability but they also identify governance as the fourth pillar or dimension of sustainability. So when we are talking about governance from this perspective, these principles and criteria highlight the need for the harmonization of rules, the need for of inclusive consultation process, appropriate risk assessment and monitoring and evaluation, and the cooperation among all relevant stakeholders. So from our perspective from the project, the governance is based in the participatory processes, in the interaction of the relevant stakeholders. And it's a process that allows to set the rules in which a sustainable and circular bioeconomy is going to be developed. So the way in which the governance is, the governance is set defines the stages of the strategy development and the strategy implementation. And of course, it also affects directly um, the commitment of the actors involved and the ownership of the results and the process. The creation of the governing body is probably one of the key milestones in, in this process of, of governance, uh, particularly when the countries start working in, in bioeconomy strategy. And just to mention one example, let me talk a bit about Uruguay, which is pilot country of the project and, and is my country. Uruguay created an interinstitutional governing body with representatives from no, nine different institutions from the public sector. And there you can find the Ministry of Agriculture, Industry and Energy, uh, Economy, Tourism, Culture, and Education. And these institutions interact with international institutions as FAO within this project, and also with researchers and, and different universities at different uh, levels, depending on the topic that they are discussing. So the integration of the governing body by different institutions in different layers allows first to incorporate a multi-dimensional and cross-country cross-cutting cross sorry perspective that is key when working in bioeconomy and also uh, to have certain flexibility to be able to balance decision making and participation which are both essential for a good governance. Another key milestone in the process of developing the governance is assessing the net of the policies, programs, and initiatives from the private sector that are already uh, taking place in order to harmonize these different uh, rules, uh, different policy settings. So the purpose is to identify the regulations that create negative incentives for a circular bioeconomy to amend them, and also to identify those that can contribute to the successful development of bioeconomy to enhance them and also to identify regulation gaps. So the challenges faced by the countries in developing the, 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 the governance of the bioeconomy are many, how to effectively identify and engage the actors, particularly private sector, how to prioritize among the different policies and initiatives that can be taken into the field, and how to deal with the synergies and trade-offs among the sustainability dimensions. 
So there is a wide variety of tools out there that can be used and that are of great value to support decision-making processes. And as Pablo mentioned, uh, many of them, let me just uh, point out also quantitative approaches to conduct, uh, to conduct ex ante evaluations, to assess in advance the impacts and risk of the potential technologies and innovations, for instance, and uh, monitoring and evaluation systems that allow to keep track of the impact of the bioeconomy on sustainability. This monitoring and, and evaluation system plays, uh, still have a, a lot of challenges to be implemented regarding, for instance, the need of data. And, uh, but FAO is, is uh, providing support in the countries in this regard. And finally, let me just finish with this. From the international perspective of governance, integration and cooperation is definitely the most relevant tool to help the countries in the transition to a sustainable bioeconomy. Knowledge exchange uh, and exchange of lessons learned, capacity building, technology transfer uh, play a key role here, considering the specific context and needs. But also, we believe that the development of bioeconomy might, might defy the roles that the countries are currently playing in the international markets, depending on their technological development and relative abundance of, net of resources. So there, we understand also that international governance definitely plays a role. And in this regard, one of the principles and criteria that I was mentioning at the beginning specifically targets the need that sustainable bioeconomy should use and promote sustainable trade and market practices. And there, in our indicators, monitoring and evaluation report, we identify a gap in the need to better quantify and better assess the impacts of biomass, bioproducts and related technologies with an international perspective, not only within the countries and the need to use uh, information to promote information and transparency in this process. So I hope I didn't take that much time. I'm going to share with you the link to our project in case you would like to know more about it. And of course, you can ask your questions. Thank you very much, Christian. Maria, muchas gracias. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and for all the others, please, if you have any questions to, to either Maria or Diane or, or Pablo, please just uh, write them down so that we can uh, uh, ask them afterwards. Okay, uh, next uh, speaker, now we move to, to Finland, uh, is Laura Jalasjoki. Uh, she's working for the European Network for Rural Development, uh, which is the hub that, that connects uh, rural development stakeholders throughout the European Union. And uh, she has been involved in a lot of work uh, re with regard to the European Green Deal in, in the rural areas. Laura, great to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, it's a pleasure to participate here today. So thank you very much. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about high-level uh, high policy. Uh, policy agenda in the European Union provides enabling measures for the bioeconomy on the ground. And let's see, can I change the slides myself? I'm not sure. You can put on the, the next slide, please. Oh, yes, I can do it myself. Yes. So, uh, rural development is a key part of the Common Agricultural Policy, or CAP, as we call it in the European Union. And within this policy context, supporting a resource efficient, uh, climate resilient economy is one of the core priorities. Related to this priority, the member states can program a wide range of economic and environmental initiatives, which include uh, facilitating the supply and use of renewable sources of energy, byproducts, wastes and residues, and other non-food uh, raw materials for the purpose of the bioeconomy. Uh, the CAP is right now going to a reform at the start of a new, new multi-year uh, budget of the European Union. And the next cap has nine specific objectives that you can see here, out of which one is uh, promoting employment, growth, social inclusion and local development in rural areas. This specific objective places the bioeconomy as a key, key element contributing to social economic uh, development in rural areas. Hence, the future common agricultural policy, which will absorb about a third of the total EU budget in the years to come, will continue to be a key policy framework governing and in a, in a, enabling the bioeconomy in Europe. So, uh, bioeconomy is seen as a central piece of the EU rural development agenda and likewise the rural development measures 
financing and strategies can be key enablers of the transition to a circular bioeconomy. In this context, what is interesting is the potential of bioeconomy value chains to create jobs and economic growth in rural areas while respecting the ecosystem's boundaries, the things that many of the previous panelists were already referring to. So there is uh, no one single intervention type in the rural development policy in Europe that would specifically address the bioeconomy. However, several of the rural development interventions that are recognized within the CAP are being used to enable the bioeconomy. They can be applied in a strategic way to support new local bioeconomy value chains from the very first steps of innovation and testing to the market consolidation. Uh, they include, for example, a very interesting model of participatory grassroots uh, innovation that builds on cooperation between farmers and scientists, called EIP Agri. Other very key measures here uh, that have been used a lot for bioeconomy initiatives include um, investment support for farms and rural uh, startup enterprises, information and knowledge exchange support and farm advice, and support to the establishment of producer groups. Such measures are very central in enabling the development of the bioeconomy by small rural actors. Uh, finally, another very successful modality of the European rural development support is the funding for community-led local development. The local economic development strategies that uh, can be established and implemented by this measure can be instrumental in mainstreaming the bioeconomy to the ground. So I repeat, none of these measures are specifically uh, tailored for the bioeconomy, but they can be used and combined uh, to support the bioeconomy. And similar interventions can be used also in the decade uh, ahead of us. And I repeat that in the future cap, the bioeconomy has an even more explicit place as a building block of vibrant uh, rural areas. For me, the very interesting opportunity in all this lies in the possibility to promote locally anchored, inclusive and sustainable development. The whole perspective of seeing the bioeconomy as part of rural development can also enable a bottom-up governance of the bioeconomy. And I think this stands in contrast to a kind of development that is steered by uh, policymakers or by big industries, and that often tend to see the rural areas as mere providers of raw materials. Uh, Bottom-up development of the bioeconomy goes hand in hand with empowering people and communities with their increased climate resilience and with a just transition. Uh, that was it so for my main points. Uh, I'm glad to provide more information for whoever is interested in learning more about the bioeconomy in the EU uh, rural development agenda. And you can also find plenty of concrete case examples of, of how this has been done already in Europe on uh, the ENRD's uh, rural bioeconomy portal or on our YouTube, on YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Laura. You're uh, really just on time. Thank that's perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh, we come to our last speaker. Uh, it's uh, Professor Justus Wesseler from uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, he's professor of, of, of agricultural economics and rural policy. Um, Justus, please, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Now, uh, when we look at the uh, development of the bioeconomy, there's one important issue that we always have to take into uh, consideration for identifying what might be appropriate governance uh, systems. And when I talk about appropriate governance systems, then I mean basically what are opportunities to improve uh, the governance systems that we currently have uh, in place. Now, for improving or addressing the uh, societal challenges that we are facing, uh, technological change will be of, of uh, importance. And when I talk about technological change, I have a very wide interpretation of what I mean with technological change. We had this morning a session, for example, there was a f uh, company reporting about uh, cultivation of uh, organic uh, hemp that they uh, use uh, for processing biomass and producing a number of products out of this. And that can also be other methodologies, for example, converting biomass using biogenerators, uh, bioreactors, extracting cyanophycin or other uh, possible uh, biopolymers. And it's, this can be other uh, systems that um, also contribute to uh, sustainable development in the sense of protecting nature reserves um, and uh, more. 
But technological change by no means is the silver bullet for all our solutions. When we look at all the uh, developments that we have uh, observed over the past years, and for example, if you look at the bio uh, industry consortium and other activities, a number of technological solutions basically have been uh, developed. They are at different stages of, of being used. And it seems, at least from my perspective, that uh, uh, finding technological solutions is not so much uh, the problem. The problem is more that uh, we get an, a governance system, an institutional environment that makes use of using these technological developments. And this has been already addressed uh, by the previous uh, speakers, um, where all these challenges are lying there ahead. Now, when we talk about uh, science-based evidence and how we can um, uh, assess this, economists have a number of uh, possible tools available uh, for um, assessing basically what might be the contribution of technological changes. And we have seen eight videos that have been posted here on the website that use different approaches uh, to demonstrate to what extent uh, such kind of assessments can be implemented. The interesting um, observation there is, and that holds in general for all the models, not only for the eight that we have uh, seen, that first of all, models need to be transparent. No model is perfect and the reader or the user of the model has to have a good understanding how this model basically is set up. Secondly, for um, assessing, let's say, uh, what might be the implications for uh, policy, what might be the implications for uh, economic development, we need models that also take uh, opportunity costs uh, in, into account. And for example, uh, CGE models are a, a widely used and very useful tool for doing such kind of assessment taking because it, it allows us to take exactly uh, uh, opportunity costs into consideration. Now, one of the big challenges with all these models is they depend on the quality of the data being available. And I think there is a lot of a challenge still ahead of us. We work, for example, in the Biomonitor project, developing input-output analysis and CGE models for the uh, European Union. And when you look into the details of the data, what you quickly will discover that the uh, fine grain that we would love to have to be able to say more in more detail about uh, the contributions of the bioeconomy to regional EU-wide uh, development the details of the data are often not available. And there is still a challenge where, for example, uh, the statistical bureaus and others who provide data can help and in, uh, in, uh, support us providing the data necessary for being able to uh, provide better solutions uh, with the approaches uh, that we are using. And finally, um, there's an, another big challenge and that is looking into the futures always under uncertainty. And uh, we have to have, in one or the other way, uh, this to build in, into our modeling exercises. And that often is not easy. We use different scenario models. But I think there is also the possibility to become a little bit more uh, sophisticated by employing real option approaches, etc., that are able to allow uh, the inclusion of uh, uncertainty as well as possible sunk cost and reversibility effects explicitly into uh, account to illustrate what might be important trade-offs uh, that we are facing. And then finally, and that was also a result of the morning session, if you look at the governance issues, there's always this big debate about what is the role of the state and what is the role of the private sector. And I think there we also need to have an informed debate about what the state should do and what the state should not do, what the private sector should do and what the private sector uh, should not do. And I think uh, with this uh, conference here that we have, uh, we're already moving one step ahead. I hope that with the new Green Deal, the farm to fork strategy, that this will provide a discussion, despite all the criticism that we have against Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy observed in the, in, in some of the publications, it may provide a new forum for uh, a discussion and, and uh, finding uh, suitable uh, solutions. Thanks very much. Justus, thank you so much. Uh, um, we have now a few questions. Uh, if you, you can also, as, as uh, Jan just wrote, you, you can also go to Slido and rate. So the more votes uh, a question get, the, the earlier it is put. Uh, the first question uh, goes to, to Laura. Uh, it asks, how does the EU 
uh, uh, CAP consider impacts of European agriculture and related policies on your uh, rural development in the global south? Well, I hope I can answer a little bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the EU is now seriously thinking about the issues of uh, the impacts of its um, internal policies, such as the support to, to EU agriculture uh, to, to the rest of the world uh, as part of the Green Deal which is our new uh, new green uh, growth strategy. So there is, um, I would say, increasing attention to um, these issues, of course. And the rural development instrument with which, with which I am working is um, fairly different from the um, production support that's also part, the, the bigger part of the common agricultural policy. And I'm fully aware of the, of the um, uh, problems uh, on that part. The rural development instrument tends to support small local businesses, uh, more grassroots kind of uh, enterprises and, and um, social economic development in the EU rural communities. Uh, I would maybe see a bit less of, um, let's say, global trade off there. And I can also answer the other question immediately. I see there uh, somebody asked why why not also urban areas? Well, also the, the European Union, of course, has instruments to support um, urban areas, but I, I'm not working with them. Thanks a lot for answering. Maybe the next question to, to Diane and maybe also the other panelists can now uh, turn on the camera. So it's maybe easier to to have some this kind of panel feeling. <laughs> um, th there's one question. Uh, there are good ideas and proposals to safeguard the bioeconomy against potential negative social and environmental impacts. Are we there? Where are the gaps? Question mark. Yes, um, I think uh, we are sort of at the very beginning of this process um, here in the United States. Um, and. I, this is why I was excited to talk about the National Academies report because it really lays out the areas um, where we need to have some policy actions. I think, uh, and one reason I focused on the data piece was because I think there's some low hanging fruit there that people can already start doing on their own. I think um, some of the other issues that are involved with you know, regulatory or um, intellectual property environments are going to take more of a concerted government effort, which means different agencies of the government coming together to coordinate how we might build policy and governance in those areas. Um, and so we're at the beginning of this. Um, there is certainly a lot of enthusiasm for this, I think, across federal government. I know from where I'm sitting at National Defense University, for example, Department of Defense is very um, engaged and anxious to build uh, bioeconomy platforms for manufacturing, um, which is very exciting. Um, and I know many other agencies of the federal government are engaging on the bioeconomy as well. So I think if we can get a, a nexus uh, around which the agencies can convene and start to build uh, coordination across the government, um, hopefully that can happen in the very near term. We've we've just had an election, so uh, it will take some time to get the new people in. Uh, but I think I think it could conceivably happen. Thank you so much. Uh, there, there's another question: uh, Can the bioeconomy be a new trade barrier for the global south? Maria, you're not f f working for WTO, but <laughs> FAO. But maybe you can can answer that question. Yes, it's a very interesting question. Um, well, of course, we, we hope it, we hope that's not the case, and we hope that bioeconomy is actually a, a framework toward a better integration. Actually, what I think is that the well, the, there is a role for the international governance there in defining uh, what we want when talking about the, the integration of countries and which should be the accepted rules and the accepted integration. And we could see it for both uh, from both sides. I mean, not only from the South perspective, but also from the perspective of the countries that, uh, that are the demanders, the consumers of the biomass, for instance, and the different hidden risk of the, of the consumption that, that, that they take. And um, the other thing that I would like to, that I would like to point is that, um, uh, 
Here we have to take into consideration not only the production perspective, but also the consumer's perspective. And uh, probably many of the requirements will come from that side. So it's very important for all the countries to be part of this conversation, to have into consideration the consumer's uh, demand and uh, try to achieve and keep in mind the sustainability uh, demands particularly. So I could ask, address the question. Thanks a lot. And another question or a couple of questions I think go, go to used to regarding the, the data and the, and the modeling. Uh, you mentioned the, the state and the private business as important by economy actors. I mean, are they considered, the consumers and the public in your models? Um, yes, so if, um, in these models that we normally use, we have a demand and supply side. And for example, if you uh, if you have a computational general equilibrium model you have on the supply side you have the business sector for example and on the demand side the uh, consumer sector but you can make this model a little bit more sophisticated by differentiating really along the supply chains now um, cges normally do this uh, at more aggregated level and we have then a number of tools going into what we call partial equilibrium models or supply chain models depending on the specific questions that we ask to investigate in more detail, for example, what might be the contribution of the private sector with respect to a specific objective to be achieved and what might be stumbling blocks. The same coming from the demand side, we may look into what is the uh, uh, relevance of consumer demand uh, for uh, specific uh, products of the bioeconomy. And we have heard this uh, in the previous talk by Pablo, for example, voluntary or uh, uh, mandatory standards. Uh, to a certain extent, they are uh, also private sector or consumer uh, um, driven uh, standards that then are picked up by the retail sector and then trickling down through the supply chain. And we can capture this as well. And it always depends on what is the specific questions that we ask. And then we normally try to select the most appropriate uh, modeling tool for this. Th thank you. Uh Pablo, there's also a question directed to you. How effective are, from your experience, the voluntary commitment schemes that you mentioned? What are incentives for companies? Uh, I think all depends what this, the companies that we are talking about and which value chains these companies are engaged. The, what we have learned is that the major corporate players have been embracing corporate or voluntary commitments as also as a way to reposition in the market and build their competitive advantage on those markets. So now if you are embracing sustainability standards, you may be able to compete better on those markets in the future that are going to demand more standards. Uh, uh, so the problem is how is that upstream players, they may adopt these standards or commitments because they may not have the motivation to do that because they cannot still reap the benefits of doing that because this has costs and not much short-term benefits. A process that we are uh, looking at now, uh, observing is that also the big corporates are moving beyond their own supply chains and try to embrace uh, and support larger transformations from the places in which they are supplying. So they are on this process of building partnerships. So it's going to have these cascading effects that may have benefits upstream the supply chains as well. I hope I uh, answer your question. Th thanks a lot. Another question to Maria. Uh, um, uh, it's for, for a country like, uh, like Uruguay. What are the expectations towards big economic blocks like the EU, US, now this new Asian trade association? What, what do you think? Uh, well, I'm not part of the, of the Uruguayan government, so I can only give my opinion as someone who was uh, born and raised there. And of course, these, these blocks are our more important, uh, the, the biggest uh, markets of our exports and of our trade and uh, of all the exchange that we have in terms of goods and services. So it's always important to have in mind what is to have very present what is going on in the European Union and the United States. Um, then what we expect from their strategies, honestly, it's very hard for me to answer this, this, this question, but always uh, place for more complementation in the different roles that we play would be appreciated, I guess. 
Thank, thanks so much. I, I think uh, I, I'd like to question another. I, we, I think we partly already discussed some of the, the, the questions that are still in, in the list. Um, uh, one I'd like to ask, uh, th this is mainly uh, uh, examples on, on the high income countries with high levels of democracy. Uh, unfortunately, Julius, Julius is not here, but, but still the question, what are prospects for bioeconomy, governments and stakeholder engagement let's say in other parts of the world with much lower income, other um, problems. Um, Pablo, maybe you want to answer, try to answer that? Yeah, part of that has to do what I was calling all this governance deficit for the governance perspective. But at the same time, I think ma many of these countries also, they rely on informal economies. And for me, one of the challenges is going to be how to build the necessary incentives uh, that could also influence or shape behaviors of farmers and other stakeholders being part of these informal economies. And that's, and that's actually the challenge because many of the market-based mechanisms that we are used to think about, you no know, taxes, fiscal incentives, et cetera, et cetera, that may apply in, in developed economies, they don't necessarily apply in developing countries and there are important gaps for example talking about my experience in southeast asia there are important gaps between uh, farmers that they may comply with the standards they can be so efficient they can have access to credit and technologies and make these steps and you have farmers that they just get uh, uh, they don't have the capacities they don't, don't have the motivations to do that so i think that's why I also think that building these partnerships that uh, should become a bit more ambitious to uh, narrow those gaps between the more capitalized farmers and the less capitalized rural producers are quite important to mobilize in finance, transfer technology, provide extension services, et cetera. And acknowledging that many of those farmers also, they are part of these informal economies you know, that they have, different motivation and, and, and incentives through which they have access to services and resources. When, when you, maybe a question to all of you, a bit going away from, from the direct questions posed, uh, when you think of how to go forward or to, to, to do better, uh, how to integrate these different approaches, the science, the policy, the governance, um, uh, players, either companies or, or, or governments, what, what do you think, what are maybe the most important um, um, improvements you, you can currently think of or what should be, should be the next uh, steps? I don't know who want to be first. Yeah, I yeah maybe Eustace, please. I can say something on this. Um, when we look at uh, the developments in the bioeconomy and when you look into uh, what's the private sector, basically the one who is driving uh, these developments reports, whether we look into the United States, Argentina, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, Asia or Europe, one of the um, stumbling blocks that uh, they are facing that are, uh, they are related to regulatory issues. And um, I think there are a number of opportunities, for example, to harmonize on the regulatory environment that basically uh, the markets for products might be enlarged and the regulatory costs being reduced without compromising on safety. We have a number of regulatory uh, policies that can just be improved by streamlining, by having a more dedicated governance scheme about how documents are handled, etc., without reducing the safety. But they can save a lot of time and harmonize the markets, and that provides some stronger incentives for further investment. We had this morning in our session someone, Mats Asprem, uh, he's investing in forest uh, in uh, Africa. He's uh, he was heading the largest private forestry company in Africa and now has a, another business. And what he was saying, that is exactly the problem they are facing. They produce poles, for example, for electrification, but the standards with the poles in Africa are so different by country 
there the camps, the institutional issues in, in, uh, involved, uh, corruption, etc. But that is basically preventing to a certain extent and that they uh, would be able to electrify Africa much faster than it currently been done. And there are another of, uh, a number of other examples. And they do not cost a lot of money, they just cost government will to address uh, these issues. And I think the international community, FAO, European Union, United States, United Nations, I think they can play their mayor role to push a little bit further the boundaries there uh, to make it easier for get, uh, to ripe the low-hanging fruits uh, that are around a lot. Th thank you. M maybe we move to Diane. Uh, the U.S. might be back on the in, in the international community. So <laughs> uh, what, what do you think or what's your expectation for, no, no matter, we don't speculate about the next president, but uh, what do you think about the, what could the next administration do about promoting bioeconomy? Um, well, certainly uh, we're hoping that uh, this idea to have a whole of government coordination and a national strategy for a bioeconomy um, can move forward. I, I, um, you know, I can't predict, but I, I certainly hope that um, the momentum that's been expressed throughout the agencies um, will cause that to happen. I agree with some of the comments that were already said about um, regulation and having a regulatory environment that um, promotes the bioeconomy. I think that that's important. But I will also say that here in the US we have um, we have the experience of again the the private sector driving the innovation. And so unlike some other areas of technology innovation where the government has been able to innovate those things and spill them into um, the public community, it's it's the reverse. And it is the, the private sector innovating and the government trying to catch up. And so one thing I'd be very excited about is to have some interdisciplinary forums and those can include international forums as well um, where uh, the government can um, harness the innovation that's happening in a real way um, and, and there can be partnerships where um, we can harness that innovation and, uh, and move move that forward in a meaningful way. Right now it feels like there's a disconnect between the private sector and the and the federal government. And so having a national strategy could really help bring those components together. And I think that's needed for having more international participation um, it is bringing the two parts together, the government and the private sector. So I hope I hope that made some sense. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, may, maybe a last question before we we then uh, split on the uh, again to Laura uh, when you when you look at the European perspective with the with the Green Deal and there have been some questions also on these impacts European and uh, agricultural policy has in in the rest of the world. Do you think that's already adequately addressed, or how could also the EU um, maybe do still better in in the future? Well, I think definitely much more to do. So many times you have nice objectives and uh, declarations on paper, but it takes some time to convert them into reality. Um, I would like to underline that um, resource efficiency is another very key uh, core principle of the world development policy in Europe. And I think this goes really closely hand in hand with the development of a sustainable bioeconomy. So, uh, when Europe or any other part of the world is developing, uh, transitioning into the bioeconomy, this should really be seen as a different process from uh, uh, traditional uh, extract and exploit and throw away uh, approach we have and has to go together with a, a change in consumption pattern as well. So uh, we have to all change our uh, way of thinking uh, towards a world that's uh, circular, more uh, resource efficient and, and consuming less, uh, less resources uh, over there. And I think these kind of principles are now becoming uh, part of the very central high level policy thinking in the European Union. And uh, that's a very, very positive uh, sign and example. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thanks a lot so much. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we still have all of you in, in one of the breakout uh, rooms uh, right now. So uh, the discussion uh, can still continue. Jan, I think I, I now hand over to you uh, to um, start the, 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 the breakout rooms. So we started with asking where the people are from. Actually, most of them were from Germany, but we also had, um, um, of course, other countries and also participants from Japan. So the next question was um, the the background, the professional background uh, of our participants. And actually, they were mostly scientists. Um, then we wanted to know what are the main barriers to the biocircular economic development at national and international scale. And you can see the, well, the most important uh, results or the a word cloud generated of the, of the entries. So as you can see, low fossil prices and bio biomass availability were the key points given by our audience. And maybe Teresa, do you want to add something here? Uh, yes, we had a, a short discussion on it, um, and uh, as an illustration of the answers that were given, for example, uh, there, there was this uh, problem of biomass availability uh, that arose from a study made with uh, producers of bioplastics. Um, they said they had difficulties uh, both to access biomass and also uh, then to, to, to be competitive with bioplastics because consumers are not willing to, to, to pay a higher price for it. And uh, among the solutions discussed, um, there has been uh, the, uh, this recyc recycling question that apparently was not uh, a good solution for this sector because the recycled material is not of uh, good enough quality to produce bio-based plastics and also uh, because uh, the recycling processes are very much energy intensive. So uh, th this would add another uh, problem to the, the first problem. Um, also, um, uh, concerning the low fossil prices, uh, it was commented that, commented, uh, that uh, an imports on uh, a tax on the imports of biomass or a CO2 tax uh, would maybe help uh, to to make the relative price uh, more balanced between fossil and, and bio-based sectors. So this was more or less the discussion for this question. And the next question was, what are the main social, economic, environmental risks of uh, bio-circular economy? And there we had actually not really a, a, a ranking, because, but more of the same a balanced um, picture of answers that you can see here. And uh, here again, the discussion was around uh, this um, answer limited biomass supply that was in fact related with ecosystem services. Uh, we are living uh, in uh, limited uh, resource uh, system and we need the ecosystems not only to provide biomass but also to uh, deliver carbon co2 sinks uh, we have to preserve biodiversity uh, and uh, uh, in front of that that problem or, or concern a proposal was, was to really uh, promote circularity and cascading uses in order to to rely less or to be more resource efficient in fact in, in other words and um, also uh, reducing consumption from the beginning would also be uh, uh, an option for example with uh, taxes to direct consumption and the, the the example of taxes on sugar sugar tax was mentioned uh, and then the discussion was around uh, the risk of exporting environmental uh, effects to third countries because of our trading, uh, well, uh, trade patterns. And there, among reg regulatory measures mentioned, were trade measures, uh, but also uh, voluntary efforts from the private sectors with private actors being conscious that uh, they can uh, guess on a more sustainable supply chain and, and, and engage towards this aim. 
and uh, also uh, by informing what's going on uh, in the supply chains and their effects the uh, people both consumers and and actors of the supply chain would be more conscious and maybe they will correct uh, inefficiencies and externalities and then we came to uh, monitoring and scenario tools uh, strengths and weaknesses and we we wanted to get the strengths separate from the weaknesses but which not completely worked out but most of the most of it uh it worked out but uh yeah time was a little short at the at the end and so the answers were fewer than before yeah well in nutshell monitoring uh and scenario tools help see the big picture but at the same time they do not uh reflect well the complexity of the real life um, they can help for comparison to, to provide comparable grounds. Um, uh, they help um, the supply chains uh, and to be more transparent, to, to track what's going on. And I give, I put and the, where are the weaknesses? Here are the weaknesses, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. And among the weaknesses, well, uh, this this prob usual problems are uh, what indicators to select. Uh, what do we do when the definition, for example, of the bioeconomy doesn't align? Um, and this problem of getting the, the appropriate data. Uh, sometimes data is it was qualified for uh, as incompatible. Uh, no international monitoring also in order to capture uh international effects not only what's going at the level national level for example where the monitoring system is implemented okay that's it okay so thanks. i share my screen thanks, susanna and Tevesia. um you had the largest group and therefore also most of the time and uh, now we're running out of time so i would like to uh, ask uh, the coming moderators to really highlight the most important aspects. Um, I'm passing over to, to Jeff now. You had a small group, Jeff, because all the Mexicans came to South America. They didn't want to be in North America, but then you were joined by the Asians. So um, let us know how it went. We were a small group, three Americans, one individual from Mexico, one from Nigeria, one from Japan, two Germans, and one silent partner who revealed nothing. What we ended up spending our time on, because we were a sufficiently small group, is that we eschewed the slidos and had a general discussion about promoting the bioeconomy. And um, a number of ideas were proposed, particularly from the standpoint of the United States. And then I will also pass this over to Christian to talk about the results from, uh, from the smaller group uh, on Asia. And the two main ideas for promoting the bioeconomy in the United States were that there's a relatively large problem with coordinating across agencies in the United States. The bioeconomy involves um, in the United States a tremendous amount of investment in things like biotechnology, in addition to circular, circular economy and renewable energy uh, issues. And um, one strong suggestion from the group is to ensure an interdisciplinary set of individuals at relatively high level of the US government who can involve security experts, uh, researchers, representatives from business and economics and who can um, promote the bioeconomy across the various agencies of the U.S. government. Complementary to those um, organizational efforts uh, at public policy in the U.S., it appears uh, from the group's consensus that there is a need to engage in a fairly uh, consistent and broad informational campaign in order to help educate Americans to the idea that supporting circular, uh, the circular economy and a sustainable economy is not at all inconsistent with economic growth and may in fact be one of the best paths forward for economic growth. There's a wide perception problem in the US about the value of uh, sustainability and about the value of a circular economy. And, and for that intervention to work, it also needs the highest level of, um, of government support. So the two major suggestions were coordination across organizations and agencies within the US and then a fairly strong informational campaign and uh, that was the, the, the focus of our dis uh, discussion. Christian, I think I might be able to pass this on to you for the summary about uh, Asia. 
Thank you, uh, Jeff. But I, I really want to be brief because uh, we'd only uh, actually one one person from from Japan, so it, it was a very small group. That's why we why we joined. I think it was interesting for me uh, to to see that this uh, in the U.S. is especially also a discussion about energy issues. Um, so the bioeconomy, in a sense, is or circular economy uh, is is against the oil producing. Um, uh, companies for whereas for for Japan uh, from from this uh, point of view it's important to to establish this bioeconomy or circular economy for example by putting a tax on on the, on the fossil fuels um, so to to transform the economy from fossil based to to bio based I think that's it for uh, for Asia thank you Thanks, Christian and Jeff. Uh, great summary. Um, here's a question for Jeff that you can maybe uh, answer in the chat uh, by Wiebke, whether there is a bioeconomy council in the US. Um, I'll pass now over to uh, the African group um, so that I can conclude with the South American group. Uh, Janos, is that you? Yeah. Yes, it is. Thank you, Jana. Thank you for the other uh, workshop conveners. Um, Southern Africa mostly was uh, the group of participants, um, Europe and the United Kingdom. Um, we talked about um, enabling governance, uh, centering around the term of access. And uh, I do this without the slider post also to make it quick. Sometimes we have to do a step backwards to move forward in the bioeconomy uh, in terms of uh, Southern African uh, access, for example, to basic services, electricity, roads and infrastructure and other things that if implemented by um, national bioeconomy plans, um, which are numerous um, consensus was among uh, discussions that policy plans and strategies are there, but the implementation capacity is um, slightly limited and education capacity building uh, came in hand, also mentioning that uh, Local value chains in Africa are rather small scale and often try to link to larger value chains and the chance of moving up the ladder in those value chains um, is, is quite small. So it is um, a issue of access, but also that, and we heard from Laura from the rural European Rural uh, Development Network that um, some ideas, for example, the idea of community-led uh, development is now implemented in Europe, which is uh, implemented in uh, African countries for a long time. And sometimes we might need, uh, besides South, South and public public partnerships in the South, we need uh, a North-South dialogue, probably as we heard from uh, Laura and um, these uh, knowledge transfers um, and uh, technologies, infrastructure and access to them were the most um, highlighted points. Thank you. Thanks, Janusz. And Janusz, I'm now uh, passing the word to myself and uh, make a quick report on the South American group. We were about 25 people in the room. Um, and uh, I don't show you the word cloud because Germany appears to be the biggest word in the cloud. Um, but that's only because only half of the people actually voted. And um, so I, I still like to believe that the majority were non-German in the South America group. Um, we also had uh, a, a large number of scientists, which is also not re representative for the real number. And uh, now to the interesting uh, points, uh, we discussed a number of, of barriers uh, in our world clouds. The point incentives or lack of incentives and uh, inequality are the ones that uh, pop up most. We, of course, also talked about uh, things that have popped up in other workshops um, and other regular groups um, that relate to finance um, and, uh, and rural poverty. <clears throat> and also um, uh, uh, private governance. Uh, but I think those two uh, points here on incentives and uh, lack of incentives and inequality are emblematic. And I think most of the participants agreed that they uh, represent important barriers that need to be addressed in different ways in different countries. Um, when we talked about risks, uh, biodiversity protection now comes up as, as the biggest one, but we also had uh, issues related to um, uh, and again, related to inequality, so uh, land rights, um, uh, marginalization of, of population groups that um, do not have formal rights um, or that are unable to participate or benefit from the bioeconomy. Uh, and there is need to address um, uh, uh, the, the issues of those groups. 
Um, we then had, uh, of course, like all the others, a session on what the advices would be from the experts in the room to um, uh, their governments. And we had a number of proposals here, um, a lot of uh, discussion about uh, partnerships and coordination. So how do we make sure that interminist interministerial cooperation takes place? Um, how do we uh, link the necessary sectors of the bioeconomy together? The territorial approach was mentioned. So how can we leverage the potential of regions, um, even within countries that can be quite heterogeneous? Um, and uh, of course, also make sure uh, that these policies are long term and uh, not only uh, short term, which uh, we heard, for example, from Argentina, where the government has changed and then the outlook on the national strategy for bioeconomy is a different one. Um, so those were I think the most important ones, I would ask the colleagues from the group to uh, um, uh, tell me if I was wrong or forgot something in the chat. Um, it's now my task to close our session. Uh, and I think we have still, uh, we had about 100 people um, in, uh, in our workshop, which, which I think is a success. Um, and 71 are still present, so we weren't too boring. Uh, you, you made it until the end. Um, I would like to, to thank you for, for joining us. And we will now, in the next uh, couple of uh, uh, minutes and hours, uh, put together a summary of this workshop. And um, if you still have an opinion that you would like to somehow um, bring to our attention, you can use Slido. Uh, the general uh, part of the Slido question and answer sessions are still open. You can post, post comments there. You can, of course, also send an email. Um, uh, I really enjoyed the discussions here today. I would like to say a big thank you to the huge team of people who supported us um, technically and uh, in terms of logistics. Uh, Max Voigt being uh, uh, the leader of that team who helped us set up all the Slido polls, but also uh, his group of research assistants who were sitting in the breakout groups uh, and to all uh, the partners uh, and the organizations that supported uh, the planning of this workshop. I think we had a great discussion. I thank you all for the participation. Hope to see you uh, wherever in the rest of the remaining bioeconomy summit, be it in the hangout uh, network room or in the plenary or anywhere else in Big Blue Button. Thanks to all of you and see you soon, hopefully in person at the next conferences and events. Bye bye.